Okay, good evening. I want to thank everybody for joining us for week two of the Equipping Minds to Reach Their Full Potential class. It is so exciting to be here with everybody here on Facebook Live. And I hope that you also saw that last week's class then went over to our YouTube channel. So if you go to Equipping Minds on YouTube, you'll not only see this class from last week, this week, and the next few weeks, you're also going to see some other videos. They're going to help you understand more about Equipping Minds, see some um, advanced exercises. Please don't get intimidated by those. But to also hear some testimonies from parents whose students have been doing the program. The other day I was talking to one of the parents who was watching the Facebook Live. I work with her daughter and she has been um, sharing this with so many folks. And just so those of y'all in the room know, we had hundreds of people all over the world joining us last week, which was just fabulous. And so as far away as India and Israel and Mexico and um, Switzerland, uh, it has just been so exciting to be able to see that and how we are going um, to do that. So yes, so as we're going tonight, one of the questions that was asked was why would you do a free eight week class and give so much away? And the mom said to me, well, that's easy because you're answering so many prayers of parents. And I have the privilege of talking to parents all over the world and interventionists and teachers, but I need to take you all back eight years. When I was at church on a Sunday morning and a parent came up and said, I would like to ask the schools to let you come in and work with Rose. And that's something that at that time, it kind of took me back a little bit because if you remember from last week's class, the focus had been on students like my son, um, students with language processing disorders and dyslexia and dyscalculia, ADHD, dysgraphia, a lot of kids who were at at least um, an average functioning intelligence score, but who had some glitches that just really weren't reaching that full potential, that things were interfering. Well, when this mom came up and said she was going to ask the schools, I think she could see the hesitancy in my face for a second. And she said, Carol, I just want you to do with Rose what you do with so many other children increase her processing, her comprehension, her working memory, her reasoning skills. And so we went before the school, it got approved, and I would say there was a little bit of skepticism from some of the folks in the room because she had not progressed from third grade into fourth grade on her testing. And when that happened, um, the mom was exceptionally concerned because she said, well, what we're typically doing to help her with remediation of the subjects is not working. By doing more reading, by doing more math, those things aren't getting better. And so that's when the new director of special ed actually kind of took a risk and said, yeah, we're going to let Carol come in 
and play games with Rose. And so every day for 45 minutes, instead of Rose going to her remediation, she actually came and we played games together. And she had no homework that was being sent home. So kind of keep that in mind. No homework, I'm the remediation, playing games. We looked at Blink last week. She loved playing Blink. Well, I would get to the school and Rose would be sitting in the office because she had declared that she no longer worked for the teacher, she only worked for Miss Carol. And nobody was very happy about that. And, and the comment was made, well, why she, did she get to go play games with you when she hasn't done anything for us all day? And this had been going on for a while. Well, we had been working nine weeks. And that day, the principal met me at the door. And you remember me saying, I used to be a headmaster of private schools. So I knew this was either really good or really bad. And she said, have you seen the scores? And I said, what scores? And in Kentucky, they do map testing. It's a measure of academic performance that they do three times a year. And I said, well, no, but what did you want to see? And she said, we like to see a three to five point gain between fall and winter. And when I talk to schools who use the map testing, I'll say, is that a fair assessment? And they're like, absolutely. Yeah, three to five point gain. And she looked at me and she said, Rose just went up 20 points in reading, 11 points in math, 25 points in science, and 17 in language. She said, no one goes up double digits, and not in all four areas. I've never seen anything like this. So we kept working. We had three more weeks. We had done five days a week for 12 weeks. The next thing I know, Rose's mom um, had contacted a bunch of other people. I'm getting a phone call from the University of Louisville to go over and meet with them because they want to see this workbook, okay? Now, you all have, this is the fourth edition. The first edition that I took to them was a fraction of this size, <laughs> I'll tell you. But I took it over and she looked at it and she said, oh, I see where this would increase processing and working memory and executive functioning. We want to do research with you. And y'all, you could have knocked me over. I was a mom obsessed with helping my son and then with helping anyone else. And what I didn't tell you about Rose is this. Rose has Down syndrome. And so to make those kinds of gains had never been seen anywhere in the world in a nine week period. Now I will tell you when um, I heard that at the University of Louisville from the, the top experts in the field of Down syndrome, I had a little pause in my heart and I started researching on the internet frantically about research in Down syndrome and, and cognitive abilities. And I came across the Feuerstein Institute. And the Feuerstein Institute is located over in um, Israel, in Jerusalem. And when I speak with a group of educators, I'll say, does anyone in here know who Reuben Feuerstein is? And I might have one hand at best go up. But if I say, does anyone in the room know who Piaget is? Every hand is raised. Well, Feuerstein would be a student of Piaget's. 
and he disagreed with his teacher. Because Piaget had said that this is how you develop. And here are these four stages. But Piaget saw that as a student left to the environment and actually wasn't counting on a human mediator interfering and coming alongside. And that's what Feuerstein, as a devout Orthodox Jew, saw growing up that his father, his mother, as they would study scripture, the importance of that human mediator being there. And so after he had gotten through um, Holocaust camps and had gone on, was a cognitive psychologist, he was actually put over those refugees from um, World War II that flooded into Israel and because they had been through so much trauma, when they were assessed, it looked like their cognitive abilities were very weak. But it was really the trauma that was impacting that. And so he came up with a theory called structural cognitive modifiability. We now know it is neuroplasticity, that the brain can change. And in 1980, he was here in the United States giving a talk on that and said, the brain can change with people with Down syndrome, with traumatic brain injuries, who've been through severe trauma. And half of the room got up and walked out. He was up for the Nobel Peace Prize. Over 80 countries use his work. 2,000 research studies. I had never been so excited to hear about a man in my life, but at the same time, so angry. How had I not heard? How were we not talking about the possibility of remapping the brain? How was he a visiting professor at um, Vanderbilt, at the Peabody Teachers College, and at Johns Hopkins? And, and that Columbia Teachers College published his books. His last book, Changing Minds and Brains, is absolutely phenomenal. Well, when I heard about him, I immediately sent him an email. And guess what? They immediately got back to me. And they said, please send us your workbook. And I did. And they reviewed it and they said, we know why what you do works. We know why, what's your program, those results that you saw with Rose, that not only increased her processing and her working memory and her comprehension, but it generalized to academics that those kinds of gains were seen in just nine weeks of intensive intervention. But so that was life changing. Um, Equipping Minds has never marketed, but we're in over 40 countries because of what happened with Rose. Because when parents get excited about really what I believe can happen in the brain, because one thing that I loved about Feuerstein was that he was also a devout theist. And as a Christian, I'm also a theist, and we both believe that we are all created in God's image. And because we're created in God's image, that the brain has the ability to change. And so as all that was going on with Rose, the next thing I know is this is spreading all over the United States and all across the world, is the short version. And so we no longer were then working with people locally, we started working with people online and doing the therapy online. Um, I would, I told you before I had gone back, got my doctorate in education, and through that process, kept working with Rose. 
And even though I'm not a big fan of testing, it always serves me well. Because when any of our students have psychologicals or academic testing, and then they get retested, they make really substantial gains. <laughs> and so we actually followed Rose's testing for four years. By her seventh grade year, y'all, she scored in the 39th percentile on the Stanford 10 in math. She has Down syndrome. If you know what they say about children with Down syndrome and being proficient in math, she scored above the state mean, the 36th percentile in science. That four-year case study has been published in the Christian Education Journal, a peer-reviewed journal, their special um, education edition. It's been published in the book. This is a college textbook. Uh, chapter 12 is mine on neuroscience and Christian formation. And then in the book, Human Development, Equipping Minds with Cognitive Development. And this is my doctoral research that was then made into a book in the disability series with the Journal of Alternative Medicine Research. And so in all three of those publications, Rose's scores, that four-year case study, are in there plus plenty of other case studies of students with specific learning disorders, autism, fetal alcohol syndrome, um, traumatic brain injuries, just to name a couple. And so I wanted to share that with you this evening because I got to talk to Rose's mom last night and she um, starts her first job this week um, is specializing in culinary arts at school. They're living in North Carolina now. Um, but it continues to be amazing the way that she is just flourishing. But as you heard me say last, last week, and you'll hear me say continually, to remap the brain, it's a commitment. Anything that we're gonna do and do well is a commitment, is it not? And so um, I wanna encourage all of y'all on that. Um, if you are on the Equipping Minds Facebook page <laughs> and you look over at the videos, you'll actually see a little video recording of Rose and myself when she was in town this summer. And she is talking about um, Equipping Minds and talking about her life and studying World War II in school and um, everything that she's doing. So I just want to um, encourage you all with that. I wanted to share that because it really is our passion to equip parents. And quite honestly, if you just hear, well, they're just in there playing games. It's hard to wrap your head around what Equipping Minds really is. And that's what we're doing in this class. Now, I told you we're approaching this like we've never approached it. We're going through this a little slowly. And I know everyone um, that I got feedback from last week was like, thank you for that. <laughs> we greatly appreciate because some of them have been in my one day workshops where they will say it is like drinking from a fire hose. So, what we're going to start with tonight is one of um, our favorite exercises that we always do when we meet a student. And you're going to get to do it um, there, wherever you are, here in this room, we're going to do it. And it's going to be a one minute game. And you're going to get to um, keep track of everything that you can list. Okay, and you're going to have one minute. So I want you to stop and think 
and you can do just little tally marks, um, do it to yourself. Usually I would have you do it with another person, but it's going to be easier tonight to just let you all do it with yourself. And this is something you can actually do at home by yourself. Um, but we're going to, I'm going to set it at one minute. And um, someone here in the class who's done this before was like, this is harder than you think. Okay, so, um, but let's just pretend. Um, now, some, of, some folks may be able to answer this question if I said, name all the providences in China, begin. Right, well, could you do that? We'll, we'll be pretty telling here in this room in um, Frankfort, Kentucky that no, we can't. Um, and why is that? Why can't we do that? We don't have those in our long-term memory. They're just simply not there to pull out, to access. So remember what I said last week, and you'll probably hear me say this every single week. We can only train the brain with what the brain knows. Right? You can only train the brain with what the brain knows. And so that's why the question really isn't name all the providences in China. It really is you have one minute to name all the animals that you can possibly think of. Begin. Okay, we're at 30 seconds. and stop. Okay, so we typically have four to five different groups when you do this. The ideal group, I'll tell you the ideal first. The ideal is that you were able to go nice and steady for the full minute and you even categorized your animals. Your animals were even categorized. Now, you could have had big cats, so to speak, or animals on a farm, or a zoo, or you could have had some sort of categories. That is the ideal, okay? Probably the most common group that we see are those that right when I said it, all of a sudden you went. I mean, it, you were just going, you were going. And if we had looked at the timer, all of a sudden at about 24 seconds, you would have frozen. And you would have had this thought, animals? Do I know animals? And you go blank. And then it had been about a 10 second pause and you probably picked up eight to 10 more animals before we ended. Okay, probably most common group. Then we have the group that you could be doing this with a student or an adult, and they may say, turtle, pig, horse. Did I say turtle? Turtle, pig, horse. 
and maybe you get around seven animals in that minute. Okay? But the reality is they know tons of animals. It's not that they just know seven. It gives you an idea of how they can access information in their long-term memory. Now then, one of the most interesting groups is when I say to begin, and there's silence. The longest I've had was 17 seconds. And I just, I didn't prompt, I just sat there, smiled, didn't, and I could tell he was actually thinking. And then he unleashed 31 animals. And my heart just stopped because I thought, how many times has someone asked him a question and hadn't waited 17 seconds for him to answer? And so by playing this game, which you can play anywhere, and people will say, oh, is that like, you know, we're in the car and we're playing this or that or whatever? Yes and no, okay? Because sometimes in the car, whether you're doing um, things alphabetically or something, but you're not necessarily pulling a list from your long-term memory. When Rose and I would play it, she loved to start doing them alphabetically. And we read a story about a platypus one day, and she was like, oh, platypus, pee, put it in the pee. And so she could just roll those off. And it's a fun thing to do if you want to do it in a classroom or in a group to go around the class and do it um, alphabetically. But you can do this with whatever that person in your life has in their long-term memory. And that's going to be different. If you're working with your 85-year-old father or you're working, you know, with a five-year-old. Now, we're also going to learn a little exercise to help with it. I see everybody touching your fingers. And we're going to go round and not flat, but round, OK? And we can start with one hand and touch the tips and just keep going forwards and backwards. And if you have some students or adults that this is really challenging, you may need to just start with two fingers, OK? Now, if you know, and if then you can do both hands simultaneously, and then even if you can go ahead and cross, Now, if you know someone who's had a stroke, this is something a doctor will do to actually check to see if they've had one, to see where things are neurologically. And it's one of the first exercises they'll do after. But for some reason, many times, they don't talk about the importance of doing this for a lifetime. Because you know what this does? It activates our grasp or our palmar reflex, and it's used to access language. So if you were in the middle of a test or in a meeting, and all of a sudden you go blank and can't remember something, start doing your fingers. Now, this is the only caveat. If it's not in there, this will not work, <laughs> OK? <laughs> But all the time, students will tell me that they can do this in class, and then it will come back. Um, but please work on that for me. It's also going to help with handwriting as well. Um, and you're also working on that interior muscle in your hand. And you can even do it when you're uh, bending like this. OK? But why did we need to do that one first? because my second favorite one to do, and I always go right to this, 
are going to be the animals. And so we're going to come up and for those of y'all online, we're going to go over to our animal page. <coughs> And I have a big one here, and everyone in the room, you can pull up yours for me. And um, I was actually talking online today with Dr. Eric Chudler. At, um, he's up at the University of Washington, and he <coughs> created these and gave me permission years ago to use these, which I'm forever grateful to him. And so we're going to look at set one. And we're going to read the animals together. Now, when we read something, we're always going to go from left to right, like you're reading, OK? And if you have some students that you need to only let them see one line at a time, that's OK. You may need to do that just for visual tracking. But let's say these together. Is everybody ready? And we're going to go penguin, giraffe, bear. You ready to begin? Let's go. Penguin, giraffe, bear, bird, spider, camel, <laughs> chicken, pig, zebra, snake, tiger, elephant, turtle, cow, fish, cat, frog, crab, bee, horse. OK. And so that's where a lot of times I'll do this right after I ask the animal question. Because sometimes the student who maybe only gave me seven animals, and I'm saying, oh, I know you know more. And they come over here, and they have no problem at all saying these animals <coughs> for me. Um, and so this is something that they'll work on. And I will tell you, I had a little girl who the first time she said this, it took her 45 seconds. And by the end of seven weeks, she was in my um, research study. She could do it in 3.5 seconds, y'all. So she's basically not breathing and really saying, penguin, giraffe, bear, bird, spider, camel, chicken, pig, zebra, snake, tiger, elephant, turtle, cowfish, cat, frog, crabby, horse, right? And so she could do that. And then we would say, well, you now say them backwards. And then it wasn't quite as fast, but she got really fast with that, very fast. OK, so now I will tell you I also um, include parents in this. So as you've heard me say, our heart's desire is yes to train interventionists and teachers, but parents. And so we're going to look at set two. And I always use this in an evaluation. And I probably shouldn't say this to the whole world right now. But when I do an evaluation, I always evaluate the parents. I always include them. And I always have them do set two first before the student. So let's look at set two. Uh huh. Yes. So as you look at set two, you may notice something. What have they done? They have mislabeled our animals. And so what we're going to do is ignore the wrong word and tell me the animal you see. Ignore the wrong word and tell me the animal you see. Now, my other favorite words, now this is going to be challenging, but we're going to do this together. I will help you. OK? So are you all ready? OK, let's go. Penguin, giraffe, bear, bird. Spider, camel, chicken, pig, zebra, snake, tiger, elephant, turtle, cow, fish, cat, frog, crab, bee, horse. Okay, 
And y'all are probably glad that you got to do that as a group and not one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, it's very common all the time. People will say penguin, camel, bird, and um, just start reading those. So that is a great example of how having a distraction can slow us down and affect our accuracy, right? Yeah. Um, and some of y'all may say, well, my child can't read. So is that really going to work for them? You'd be surprised that many times they are still familiar with some of those first letters. And so it's still, maybe they've actually seen some of those words and it's just not fitting. There's something about the brain that says that that's not right, it's not working. Okay, so these are some other great processing exercises to do. Now this one just became a little bit, not a little bit, a lot of a working memory exercise because you were having to ignore that, okay? But I wanted to go ahead and let you guys do set two tonight. Um, last week we spent so much time on the cards and I wanna talk for um, a minute on that. I hope everyone got to use your blink cards and um, to work on them saying the numbers or the colors or the shapes um, and then practice sorting those. And so if you didn't get to do that with Blink or if you had the UNO cards at home to use your UNO cards or to use your deck of playing cards, remember, because we can do those um, as well. So I hope everyone had a lot of fun with that. That was your homework to use that with those or even with if you had set or quitch or anything to work on that. And the other thing I want to touch on just a minute is that I had some questions um, this last week and someone said, well, what if my child is nonverbal? Well, you are their voice. It's very fascinating. The more that I did research, the more that I looked at the brain, and went back in time, I actually also stumbled upon the father of modern education. And if I ask this question, has anybody heard of a man named John Amos Comenius? And guess what? No hands ever go up, it seems. And he was the father of modern education. And you would think, especially when I'm training a group of educators, that some hand would go up, right? Shouldn't we know that? And so I want to share, I'm actually going to do one day, I'm writing a paper on what John Amos Comenius knew about neuroscience. Because he talks about the importance of mirror neurons. But he also said this. Here we have mirrored before us the marvelous wisdom of God, who was able to arrange the small mass of our brain should be sufficient to receive so many thousands of images. What unscrutable wisdom and power God lies here. And who will not marvel at the abyss of memory, which exhausts all things, which gives all back again, and yet is never over, over full or too void? So he was talking about mirror neurons and long-term memory. And knowing that our long-term memory capacity is unending which is absolutely phenomenal that he had that insight. And so he just continues throughout this book, and we'll look at little, little pieces. Um, 
it is just amazing because he'll say, in the fourth place, we need to remember when teaching to have patience, to help them, to strengthen them, and to not be disheartened. Though some pupils take longer to come to maturity, they will probably last all the better, like fruit that ripens late. And just as the impression of a seal made in lead lasts a long time, though hard to make, so these men have more stable characters than those who are more gifted and do not easily forget what they have once learned. And so he could acknowledge that some students, and we see that, do we not, in maturity and in growth, but we seem to want all students to follow that same path when as we get to adults and in college, do we see everybody who's 25 at a certain point or 30? No, sometimes we even say, when are they gonna grow up, right? <laughs> so to speak, um, but wanted to kind of let you know that this idea of unlimited potential in the brain was actually written in the book, The Great Didactic, by John Amos Cominius, the father of education, who was also a reformed theologian. And he would revamp the school systems in England and Sweden and across Europe. And some call him the father of developmental psychology. Piaget actually loved John Amos Comenius and wrote a paper on um, the importance of John Amos Comenius and said he was born 300 years before his time, that the insights he had, Piaget couldn't understand how he knew the, the depth of learning in the brain that he did in the 1600s. And if you read about his life and story, you'll find that it was very inspired, I believe, by his faith in God and um, as well there. Okay, so the next one we're going to look at tonight are numbers. And this is a fun processing one because we're going to be using this. So I see you going to your colored numbers page let me do keep going here we go okay so y'all can see the big one up here and what we're going to do is simply read the numbers we see from left to right Okay, so let's begin, and we'll start at the top left. And I like to model for the students. And like I said, if you have a student that's nonverbal, that you're there with them, you're being that voice. Or you can also take a phonics phone. And I brought one tonight. This is two pieces of PVC pipe. And you would turn it and put it to their right ear and you would speak into it, you would whisper, because this amplifies, please. Um, and that's also going to make sure that input is getting directly to that language center as well. Okay, um, so we'll always use, I'll always use the right ear because of the connection to the left hemisphere, the language center. So here we go, let's read these together and we'll do these first lines. Two, one, Five, four, one, three, three, four, one, two, five, four, one, four, three, five, two, five, three, one, five, four, three, two, one, three, four, five, two, one, three, one, four, two, five, three. Okay, and so if on your sheets you could go a little bit longer, we're looking just at part of this right now, but I will tell you, sometimes you'll have students start out strong on this one, 
and then they get near the bottom and they might misread something because of that difficulty with that focused attention. Now you also notice that we threw in some colors. And so, um, and this is gonna have a long standing piece with Equipping Minds because we're going to give a color to every number. And so um, we're not going to um, get in a lot of depth on that tonight, but the other thing I want you to work on this week with your students is we're also gonna go in and find on the row the number that repeats itself. So if you're looking and we see two, one, five, four, one, three, what number matches? One. So we would just draw a circle around our ones or underline the ones. I will tell you whenever I have students draw circles, I always draw my circles from two o'clock to 12 back to two, okay? If you have students that their writing is fine, but um, if you start at, and think about their clock letters. So with an O, with an A, with a C, with a G, okay? How to get that fluid motion, you're going to want to start from 2 to 12 to 10, back to 2. And so I, um, when we're doing this, we are also working on handwriting. And so one of your assignments this week is to go in and find those numbers that repeat. Okay, now let's go in and let's try to override our number for just a minute, like we had to do with the wrong word, and let's say the color of our number. You ready? Begin. Blue, green, black, yellow, green, red, red, yellow, green, blue, black, yellow, green, yellow, red, black, blue, black, red, Green, black, yellow, red, blue, green, red, yellow, black, blue, green, red, green, yellow, blue, black, red. And breathe, okay? Some of y'all, I could um, feel you having to concentrate, right? And, and y'all, what are we doing? All we're doing is saying our colors and some numbers. Okay? Yes, you're seeing them at the same time, so there's a conflict going on, and your brain is having to override that. Yes. And so that's why many times people will think, well, this just, that seems so easy. And then you do it, and it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I need to really think about that. The next thing we're going to do, and this one, you are gonna have students who simply are not gonna be able to do the whole thing on this, but we're gonna look at it anyway because you're gonna have students that are. And um, this is our vowels, okay? And so if you're also in a romance language, um, because I know we have a lot of people in Europe that are watching this right now, you can, you'll use the sounds in your language or if you're working on them learning English, you could use the English sounds as well. Now, we can do this two ways. And the first way, you can go in and simply say the name of the letter, okay? And we can just say, and we'll just do the first row. So let's just say the first row. We have A, E, I, O, U, E, okay? And you may notice that all of our A's are what color? Green. Green. All of our E's are going to be blue. 
All of our I's are going to be red, our O's are yellow, and our U is black. So you're seeing these five key colors <laughs> continuing to come up. Now, when you have students who are just learning their letters, it's important to start with only one letter at a time. And that's where I would go in and say, oh, his name is A, his sound is A. And I would take my phonics phone and we would go in and I'm going to say it in the right ear, the A. Ah. And then we're going to go in and actually, um, you'll see this on your sheet in the back of your handout, that we'll actually circle the A. Ah. Okay, but we're going to just focus on learning one at a time. And we would go in and be saying A, ah, A, ah, A, ah, A, ah, A. Ah, ah. And so we would never try to teach all five at one time, okay? When I'm doing anything with phonics, I only want to take one letter at a time. I was so thankful Clayton's, um, you know, with all of his struggles that he had, one thing his kindergarten class did, they only learned one letter a week. And because of that, he had mastery of his letters and sounds. It really wasn't too much too fast. And so that's just a key component. But if you have an older student who might look at this and say, well, this is easy. But when they go in and have to say the name of the letter and then go in and say the sound and say the color, and there's a lot of things we can process here, okay? Um, this one is a little bit more of an advanced page, I will tell you that, um, but I wanted to show it to you as something we are going to be using and developing over the next few weeks. And then the next one we're going to look at um, this evening are the colored arrows. And we would start out by looking at um, the colors, and I like to also use unifix cubes. And so I go in and I also take my cubes and I put, let's say we're going to work on our um, colors right now. I'll put yellow, and this is where I can work on the pincer grip, which is key for fine motor skills. And so they can put blue on blue and black on black, and red on red, and green on green, and cover up with the cubes. So you may have, some people have Lego cubes. Um, I would really say to invest in, in the Unifix cubes because you're gonna see me using them for everything as we're progressing in this. Um, but then some students, we need to make sure they know they're up and they're down and they're left and the right. And the way we would do this, I would take their fingers and we would stroke it and we would actually, if I was taking my cursor, it was my finger, I would say up and so I, and up and down and down and down and up and down. And so if we can see just a little bit this may be harder online, but up, up, down, 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 up, down. Down, down, up, down, up, up, down. And I always want them using their finger to touch it and say it. Being able to match what your hands are doing and your eyes and your voice is a very important skill. Now, you may notice it says colored arrows up and down and left and right. And you're like, well, I don't see left and right arrows, but you do, okay? So when we turn our page sideways, you got to see that. Um, so, voila. 
there they are. And when I do this with a student, I will take the student's hand and I will stroke it and I will do the work. I don't ask the student to do it unless they definitely know they're right and they're left. But a lot of adults are even challenged with that. So I'll stand behind them and ask them to give me their finger and we'll stroke it and say, I'll say, right, 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 and then take the left hand, left, right, 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 left, left, right, right, left, left, right, okay? And I will tell you directionality, right and left, up and down, are crucial components for reading and writing and math. And sometimes, I, I mean, I've had one student that after we got that solidified, her mom said, Carol, the next thing I knew, she was picking up a book and reading. I'm convinced it was when she conquered right and left. And so um, we have seen that be very crucial and foundational. So that is going to be your homework for this week. Um, next week, we're going to get to take all of these to a step further. The only thing... Um, the last literally one minute that we have this evening, I'm going to tell you, is on the game Spot It, and y'all have this in your handouts, you will see I have what's called a constant card. And a constant card, as you look up here, is the one card we're going to use for the entire game. And when we say what's on it, we'll always start at 12 o'clock, and I'll say, I see a brown house. I see a man walking. I see a golden acorn. I see a red knife. I see colorful leaves. I see a red chair. I see a gray and white raccoon. I see a brown moose. Okay, and I'm always going to model saying that in a full sentence with the color. And then when we look on the other card, we find the two things that match. And I would say, oh, I see two red chairs. And we would play the game, but we would always keep the constant card. That first card that says constant card we would use the entire game. And at the end of the game, I would then hide the constant card, okay? And then ask the student, so what did you see on the very first card? And, and with some students, their parents actually play the game always with that card for a while because they're trying to see there are eight things on there if they can get those eight things into their long-term memory, okay? So that was just taking some more games for you guys. Now you've got tons of things to use for your processing with the card games and with these handouts. And next week, be ready to really have a brain workout because we're gonna add um, a lot of working memory steps, but thanks for joining us this evening. Y'all have a wonderful week.